Dames en heren, ladies and gentlemen, geachte collega's, dear colleagues, beste Callum, dear Callum, I hereby, I hereby formally open this session and I welcome you all to the public defense of Mr. Callum Hawcroft. Mr. Callum Hawcroft has presented to the faculty his PhD thesis on the topic stellar wind properties of O-type stars mass loss, speed, structure, and quantitative empirical analysis in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of PhD in science, astronomy, and astrophysics. He shall now publicly defend his PhD thesis. So, uh, Mr. Callum Hawcroft, you are invited to give a presentation of about 45 minutes about your work. And afterwards, the examination committee will ask questions and discuss your work with you. So please be seated. And I now give the floor to Mr. Callum Hawcroft. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, so I guess everyone can hear me all right. The microphone's about here. Uh, yeah. So I'm Callum. And it's my time to present to you all the work I've been doing for the past four years for my PhD. And as uh, Magritte nicely introduced there, the uh, So it's a full science title of stellar wind properties of O-type stars, mass loss speed structure, and quantitative empirical analysis. Uh, but that's quite a lot to start off with, right? So I think we should start with maybe a more general thing that I would say when people ask me what I'm doing, and that's, I would just say, I look at stars. Uh, so you can actually learn quite a lot by just looking at stars. Um, one of the first things you can see uh, when you go up and look at one of your favorite constellations, uh, for example, Orion there in the top, corner you can see Betelgeuse, which is a much redder star uh, than a lot of the other stars in the sky. And so you can immediately start to characterize uh, yeah, any stars that you want to see just by color, and that correlates with temperature. And so you have here your first sort of axis to plot stars on, so temperature uh, increasing from red to blue. Um, and this is also where the first sort of bit of uh, jargon comes in, and that's O-type stars. And so we have a couple of letter designations to Yeah, just to describe this order. So O-type stars are the hottest stars, uh, essentially. And the, so the next thing you might think, well, we've got one axis here. What's another one we can use? Um, and you can think about the, the brightness of the star. Uh, but there's a problem when you look at just the brightness of a star. Um, and that's that we don't know how far away it is. So example, if you look at uh, how the stars in Orion are actually projected on the sky, they're much you know, further away than you might think if you just looked at an image. Um, yeah, just uh, as you look up to the sky at night. Um, it's the same thing with something like the sun, which isn't necessarily a very luminous star, but it's very bright. I mean, you can look at it. Uh, you can look at other stars. And so we add the luminosity here once we know the distance, which is just, as we say, the brightness corrected by the distance. And so you find out then that the stars sort of have this nice trend uh, with temperature and luminosity. Um, and it turns out that the more luminous stars gen tend to be hotter. And so this is what we call the main sequence sort of uh, Uh, yeah, the place where stars sit, um, as for where they stay for most of their lives. Um, but you also have stars that go off of this uh, sort of general trend, and these are the stars that tend to be more evolved. So you have supergiants here, like this is Betelgeuse, essentially a red supergiant, um, and we have uh, sort of the blue supergiants here, which are closer to the stars that we'll be talking about today. Um, so as if we're focusing on these sort of hot stars in the top left of the diagram. Um, and these tend to be massive stars. So these are the stars that um, we say they form and they evolve into these really bright, luminous, um, yeah, they're supergiant stars, basically. They're very large. And they tend to be about eight times the mass of the sun uh, or larger. Um, and these are the stars that will also become either black holes or neutron stars uh, after they sort of go through the end of all of their core burning um, and go to the supernova, or maybe they collapse directly into black holes. These are sort of some of the main uh, features of the evolution of massive stars. And you can see some of the other features that we think about uh, that are important about massive stars in a sort of larger, uh, what would you say, context. So you have um, these stars tend to have you know, strong outflows. So as I say, they're, the, mo the more massive stars are forming, the more massive elements in their core, and then expelling those out into the interstellar medium. So they're uh, enriching the, yeah, the universe with things like carbon and heavier elements that are very important to, you know, Uh, stuff that's made out of carbon, like us. Um, and then, as you say, they turn into supernova, which also um, are these really energetic events that get rid of lots of material into the interstellar medium. And we also think, uh, well, yeah, they also think that, wait, so we, 
we know that the, the, the earlier stars in the universe were also very massive in general. So uh, by looking at these, we can get an idea of what was going on um, towards the beginning of the universe. And as uh, yeah, the final things, they become these really interesting exotic objects like black holes. Um, and as, because there's lots of massive stars forming binaries, uh, they can also uh, end up causing gravitational wave events. that have been a very exciting discovery over the past few years. So we talk about the outflows from massive stars as stellar winds. Um, and these aren't the same kind of wind as you would say, uh, a wind on Earth, which is a sort of wind that you know, flows around the Earth. These are stellar winds in the sense that material is overcoming uh, the gravity of the star and escaping um, out into the interstellar medium. And so if we do something like that on Earth, you need to power these big rockets to escape from Earth's gravity. Um, and you can see uh, an example of a telescope that launched uh, at Christmas. Um, but in massive stars, you have um, a much more, uh, yeah, the, the massive stars themselves actually fuel the outflows. So because they're so much more luminous than any normal star, the power from the light that's coming from the, from the star is actually enough to remove mass from the surface. So here you can see just the ratio of, you know, maybe a massive star is about 50 times the size of the sun, or 50 times the mass, I should say, maybe 20 times the size uh, in radius, but 100,000 times more bright. And that means that the photons that are emerging from the star can impart momentum on the particles and the ions that tend to be metals in the outer atmosphere of the star and throw them off the surface. Um, and you can see sort of some round estimates of uh, how much material is being lost and maybe it's uh, equivalent to one mass of the sun every 100,000 years. And if the star lives for a million years, you know, it's a significant portion of your mass. So it's, uh, it's something that's really important when you're thinking about the evolution of stars and also the evolution of the medium that the stars live in. So I'm showing you a diagram here of uh, the evolution of a massive star. And here we're taking the diagram from the beginning. We're starting off essentially in the top corner and seeing how the star goes through the rest of its life. Um, and you can see here for a 60 solar mass star, uh, it's evolving generally, uh, it's getting, uh, well, it's cooling down, it's becoming more luminous. Um, and in the sort of main sequence area that I've highlighted here, the difference uh, between these two tracks is only the amount of mass that's being lost from the star. So we're changing the mass loss rate between two theoretical predictions that have been made by simulations of stars. Um, and you can see here the Vink predictions, which are generally used in stellar evolution uh, predictions now, versus some of the more recent predictions from, uh, from Robin Bjorklund and collaborators, and the factor of three difference between these two rates is enough to already start to change the pathway of stellar evolution in the main sequence. Um, and some of these other works have explored how important this is for reproducing uh, ob observations of populations of stars, um, and it can affect the core, so it will affect the type of supernova and the amount of material that's being uh, uh, yeah, sent out into the interstellar medium during the supernova. And there's even more uncertainty at the lower temperature region where the difference between the two mass loss rates become even larger, and then you can see you know, the difference between the star ending with 50 solar masses and almost 20. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainties in, in massive star mass loss rates that we're really keen to reduce the uncertainty of. And so how are we going to do that? We've already seen that just looking at stars isn't really enough. Um, so one of the things we do is to look at uh, the star's light as a function of wavelength, and this is spectroscopy. Um, so, Yeah, sorry, I'm just showing you here a, a spectrum of the sun, uh, which is the classic spectroscopic, uh, uh, yeah, I, I suppose diagram to show everybody. You can see the spectrum uh, as a function of wavelength, sort of continuously over um, the entire visible spectrum, the whole rainbow. And it also goes off into the ultraviolet in the blue and the infrared in red. Um, but there are also these sort of discrete uh, transitions where there's no light or there's less light. And these are the sort of black lines are highlighted here. And this is absorption of uh, specific wavelengths of light. Um, and these are some of the features that we use to look at stellar winds. We'll go into those in more detail. And I highlight here that you can see, you know, a lot of this spectrum in the optical and in the infrared from, from the ground. So from large telescopes uh, like those uh, based in Chile from, uh, from ESO. And you can also, uh, well, you, if you want to look at the UV where, it, you know, it's in the blue, and that's also where most of the light from massive stars is coming from, you need to go to space because the atmosphere, it blocks all, essentially scatters and blocks all the UV light um, that's coming from these stars. And so you really need to be above the atmosphere to get proper observations in the UV. So again, now I'm showing you this sort of breakdown just as a function of, uh, of wavelength. And I guess the colors aren't so great on here, but this says UV and this says infrared. 
And you can see that the, the bluer stars are more massive. The spectrum peaks uh, in the UV, um, whereas the red stars, it's closer to yeah, the red side of the wavelength spectrum. And so this is also where, as I said, a lot of metal line transitions lie. And so this is where uh, a lot of interaction comes from the, obviously, the massive star radiation field with, with the atoms in the, in the atmosphere. And so now we can look at the absorption features in more detail. So you can see here just a little schematic of a star with a spectrum of light being emitted. And here you have an atom in the outer atmosphere that's sort of in, a, in, a, in, a, in whatever state you want. And it absorbs one of these photons at a specific wavelength that it's required for it to move up into a higher energy state. And so that photon obviously doesn't progress and the rest of the spectrum comes out and you end up with this sort of discrete absorption feature that was uh, shown in the larger spectrum before. And this happens all over the wavelength range. So here I'm just showing you an example in red. Um, and so these are some of the features we can use to determine, you know, what's, what ions and what atoms are in the outer atmosphere of the star. And some of the strength of these lines uh, can tell you about the temperature and other features that are going on in the star. Um, so one of the things we look for in massive stars to look at the winds is when you have material in the, you know, moving out of the surface of the star, uh, it can be ionized. Um, and so you see here, when you have uh, an ionized, say, hydrogen atom um, and a free electron comes along, it can recombine and then that causes emission um, at discrete wavelengths again. And you can see these are features that are obviously tracing the outflow in the star. And so we can see how strong are these emission features. And from that, it tells us something about the mass loss. Um, so I also want to point out that these aren't just, you know, uh, exact one wavelength features. They're a little bit broader than one specific energy. Um, and that's due to the Doppler shift effect. So something what people are familiar with, for example, when an ambulance uh, is your, your little telescope and an ambulance is sort of parked somewhere um, and it's emitting some siren sound at, at one wavelength. And when it starts to move towards you, essentially the wavelength uh, is compressed as it moves towards you and it's elongated as, uh, as it's moving away. So as an ambulance goes past, the sound becomes more high pitch and it becomes lower pitch when it moves away. Um, and the same thing happens to light. Uh, because it also behaves like a wave. And so you end up with, as we say, the, the same effect where some of the light is being, uh, the wavelengths being essentially blue shifted uh, in our line of sight if it's moving towards you and red shifted away. And that's how you end up with uh, these broader features uh, in emission and absorption in stars because half of the star essentially is moving towards you, the other half's moving away if it's rotating at all. Um, and so this is a, again, if you look at one of these outflows, uh, you see essentially symmetric emission. Some of it's blue shifted, some of it's red shifted, and this is the feature that comes out in the end. Um, but there's another, um, so, so this is the emission feature essentially that we're looking at for, for mass loss rates, and it's gonna be important when we go into what we're actually looking at uh, in the data for our analysis. But there's another feature um, that's, that's also important, and that's the fact that in your line of sight, there can be additional material uh, that's coming out from the star that's absorbing specific wavelengths to such a high extent um, that the light that's blue shifted from the transition is, is lost. Um, so you end up with not only the sort of absorption, uh, sorry, the sort of emission feature, you end up with highly blue shifted absorption in the transition as well because the material's moving at such high velocities away from the star. And so you end up with this, yeah, larger wavelength region uh, of absorption in the blue. And you end up uh, in some cases getting down to the point where the absorption is essentially to the extent that there's no light reaching you anymore uh, in these blue shifted uh, wavelength transitions. And so this is what we end up with basically when we look at a massive star and this is the stellar wind diagnostics we use. And so we have emission lines in, uh, in the optical uh, and in the infrared that we observe from the ground. And we have these profiles here. There's a superposition of absorption and emission and we call these p signy line profiles, and we observe these from space. Um, so that's what we look at when we're an observer. But what, it, what does the wind actually look like um, uh, is something we have to consider as well, because you know this isn't uh, necessarily a direct interpretation of what's going on physically uh, in the outer regions of the star. Um, and so we know that, as I said, the stellar winds are being driven by these ion transitions. Um, and, and you might think, well, you know, there's only so much light that can be at a specific wavelength to an accelerate uh, one particle with one uh, transition and transfer the momentum. But what happens is as uh, a particle is accelerated at a specific energy, it can be then uh, redshifted as well. And so it can be uh, accelerated by higher wavelengths of light and higher wavelengths of light, and it keeps going like that um, and to the point where it can, as we say, 
accelerate to really high velocities and actually move off the surface of the star. Um, and so this is a simulation of the atmospheres of massive stars. Um, and here I'm showing you just, uh, as I say, a density plot of the, of the outflow against the velocity of the material. And as I said, the, the acceleration uh, at higher wavelengths causes some of this sort of um, lower density material you can see in blue to actually be really high velocity in red. Um, so we need to consider uh, not only you know, the, the fact that the material is sort of clumping up into these uh, high density regions, but it also has a velocity span um, component that's going to affect all these diagnostics, as I said. If you have high velocity uh, blue shifted material, uh, it's going to be something important to look at. And so if you think about something like a, like a recombination line that's forming emission, uh, if you assume that the wind was just a smooth outflow, um, the, the recombination is dependent on density squared. And so if you then take into account the fact that the wind isn't actually smooth and there are higher density regions that's driving up the, the emission, well, you can reproduce the same kind of line profile uh, as you would with less material. And so it's, it's one of the major sources of uncertainties um, in, in our diagnosing of the, the amount of material that's leaving the surface of the star. And so a lot of the studies that are looking at uh, using, for example, recombination lines to track the amount of material leaving the star uh, have started to include clumping um, and these density enhancements. But there's still a problem uh, that comes, and that's with these UVP Cygni lines. And that's when you assume that all the clumps are optically thin. Uh, as I said, you essentially end up with such a situation where you are predicting in this sort of uh, smooth, solid line that the amount of absorption in your line of sight is much larger than what's actually coming out in the spectra, which is a sort of noisier line uh, before. And so this is something we have to account for as well. And that's something that we've specifically started to look at. Um, and so you can see here, one of the solutions that, that's been used in the past to try and uh, match the strength of these features is to reduce the, the, the abundance of the, of the ion in question. So this is a phosphorus line, and you can just reduce the phosphorus abundance to match the profile. Um, but we don't think that the phosphorus abundance should be reduced by this much uh, in the lifetime of massive stars. So we think that you know the accounting for uh, the opacity of the clumps is another way to go. And what happens when you do that has been shown in some of these sort of uh, pilot studies is that when you allow the clumps to become optically thick, you also have uh, you know the regions in between the clumps that allow for additional leakage of light. And the combination of these two things results in an overall uh, reduction in the average opacity of the wind and so the absorption is reduced. Um, and so how are we going to be able to include this when we run our models? Um, and what, what's uh, been devised by the people that include this prescription in, in the code that we're using to, to model the spectra is these three parameters, essentially, to describe the outflow from the star. So here I'm showing you just a 1D slice of the 2D wind model we had before. And here I'm highlighting uh, in red the overdense regions that are the clumps. And so we have a clumping factor that just relates the density of these regions versus the average. Um, and so that tells you yeah, how, much, uh, how, how, more, how much more dense the clumps are than the average wind. And so uh, correspondingly, we have the, the density of the interclump medium, which is uh, yeah, all the material that isn't in a clump, essentially how that relates to the average profile that you can see in orange. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, these clumps have velocity spans that we have to consider as well. And so this factor is the ratio of the velocity covered by the clumps to the velocity of uh, the material that isn't in a clump, essentially. And it, uh, in essence, it works like um, you know, if the clumps are covering more velocity space, you have a higher chance of interacting with material in the clump as you're moving out of the star, if you're a photon. And so now I can show you what actually happens to the profiles. And, and as I said, as we change the clumping factor, uh, in this case, the recombination line changes massively. So you can see that, yeah, just by a factor of two, this clumping factor can really change the strength of the profile. And that's introducing a large uncertainty and diagnosing the mass loss rate. And it's having a relatively small effect on the P-Signy profiles, which means we can start to break some of these degeneracies uh, by including uh, yeah, simultaneous UV and optical diagnostics. Um, and you can see the velocity filling then has an effect on the P-Signy profiles. As I said, the absorption becomes uh, the absorption becomes less strong if you have less velocity filling. So you can then yeah, also use that to, to yeah, sort of figure out what, what's the ratio of mass loss rate, velocity filling, and clumping that are required to match the velocity profiles. And then you also know accurately what the mass loss rate is. Um, and the interclump density has actually a similar effect to the velocity filling factor, um, but it's just maybe a little bit less strong. 
so it's harder to diagnose with what we have currently. All right, so how are we going to be able to actually optimize all of these parameters to get a solution out? As I already mentioned, there's all these wind parameters um, that we have to consider at the same time, but everything else also has an effect uh, on, the on the emergent profiles, things like the temperature and the gravity in the star um, and the turbulence uh, and also the rotation, the abundances, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so when we use uh, the code FastWind to produce synthetic spectra that models the star and then um, also creates a model of the emergent light profile, um, we need to essentially optimize all these parameters at the same time uh, and explore a large um, combination of uh, range of each parameter. And so for this, we use uh, what we call a genetic algorithm, which essentially starts with a large population of models, um, assesses randomly how uh, the, the, pop the models are randomly distributed. We start with about 250. We assess which ones fit better. Um, and then from that, we can use the parameters from those models combined together to make new models and hopefully the, the fit improves over time. So here's just a little uh, schematic simulation of that working. And here, all, all, the all the GA is trying to do is to find this high density point in the center. And you can see when the GIF loops, you have this really large uh, random space uh, that sort of hones in very quickly, but keeps exploring the other extremities of the parameter space, because uh, we just also include things like mutations to the parameters uh, over time. And yeah, you can just see here, you know, the first uh, generation versus one of the later ones. And so this allows us to find uh, statistically unique solutions um, to, to a best fit with synthetic spectra and to optimize all of these parameters simultaneously. And so this is one of the, um, yeah, just an example of one of the, the, the best fits for one star. So here we're looking at a sample of massive stars in the galaxy. Um, and you can see here that the fit quality is generally quite good. And the spectra here of lots of different line profiles. And in red, you see the best fit uh, that corresponds to the minimum in the distribution of the models uh, that's marked here in red. And then the green models that are also statistically significant. And so they also sit in this sort of region around the top uh, of the best fit of the profile. And so here you can see there's quite a lot of models, quite a lot of parameters we have to optimize at once. We end up with an OK fit. And you can see here, for something like the mass loss rate, actually the distribution is quite well defined. And so this looks like we can determine the mass loss rate with fairly good, um, fairly low uncertainties, which is what we want if we want to be able to uh, yeah, make uh, predictions of stellar evolution. And so these are the final sort of results we get for trying to determine these clumping factor parameters for the first time empirically. Uh, and you can see the clumping factor is fairly well uh, defined. Um, the velocity filling factor, not so much, but there's still a significant, uh, yeah, statistically significant um, sort of minimization of the chi-square. Uh, and for the intercom density, it becomes more difficult. So on average, we find when we look at, this is a sample of eight uh, supergiant massive stars, uh, O-type stars in the galaxy. On average, the clumps in the wind are about 20 to 30 times more dense than the average. Um, and they span maybe 30 to 50% of the velocity field. And the intercom density is about maybe 10% of the average as well. So the first time we've been able to diagnose these parameters, we tend to get fairly good constraints um, throughout a sample of eight or supergiants. Um, so what happens to the mass loss rates then once we've been able to determine this along with all these other parameters? And you can see here, I'm showing you predictions from Vink and Bjorklund in green and orange, again, for like we saw in the, the plot towards the beginning, uh, compared to blue, which is what we find um, from our genetic algorithm fits, so the empirical results. You can see that we're about a factor of three on average lower than the predictions from Vink and within 1.3 of the predictions from Bjorklund. So we have hopefully more accurate mass loss rates here and also theoretical predictions that agree with them to a higher degree. And those can hopefully be used to yeah, reduce the certain, uh, reduce the uncertainties in stellar evolution calculations, which is nice. So the next thing we want to look at, uh, now that we know this works, we can determine new mass loss rates with, uh, with also determining clumping parameters, is to look in uh, other environments. Um, one of the reasons we want to do that is because we think the strength of stellar winds changes with metallicity. So as I said, you know, the, the emerging photon field is colliding with ions and accelerating them and moving them out of the star. Um, and if you move to, you know, from the galaxy to the large Magellanic cloud, a small Magellanic cloud, you reduce the sort of average or initial metal content in the environment. And so you reduce the metals that are available to the star in any case. And so you should reduce also the, the, the amount of mass that's lost. And you can see here predictions again from Bjorkland, Galaxy, LMC, and SMC, and on average it's getting down. 
Um, and so we want to extend our work to look at a sample of stars in these environments and to get new mass substrates and the clumping parameters as well. So this is the sample we have, um, thanks to um, a survey uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, led by Laurent. Uh, it's 42 orbits of Hubble um, to look at 20 stars in the LMC and 10 stars in the SMC. And here I'm plotting in blue the galactic sample I was just discussing. Uh, and you can see here that now the LMC and the SMC sample covers a much larger range uh, in, in this temperature luminosity diagram. So we can really start to see you know, if there are any trends in the mass loss rates that we're finding. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of a, a great improvement uh, on determining mass loss rates for massive stars across this diagram. And so I'm just going to show you quickly the same methods all apply. So we can just see the results for one star in the LMC as an example. And you can see the fit quality is, again, quite high. Um, and there are some issues just because as you go you know, to the LMC, which is much further away than a galactic star, uh, some of the data quality becomes a bit lower. And so the peaks aren't as well defined, but there's still statistically significant solutions coming out. Um, so we can then you know, find out what's going on to all these clumping factors. There's sort of a lot of information here. So the, sort of the main takeaway is that um, you know, we're looking at 20 different massive stars in the LMC, whether they be supergiants or slightly smaller stars. Um, there tends to be a general trend in clumping factors with the temperature of the star. So the, the, the trends we find in, in the velocity filling and the interclump density are statistically significant. Um, it's also, uh, there's a fair trend with clumping factor as well, but it's not as, uh, as significant. It's not statistically significant, I should say. Um, but yeah, generally, as you say, increasing clumping factors with temperature, which is a nice trend we can also use when predicting uh, stellar evolution. Um, and so this is not super intuitive, but there's recently also been some theoretical uh, work that thinks um, that there's also uh, uh, essentially a trend with the growth rate of the instability in the wind that goes with temperature as well. So there's also some theoretical, um, I guess, evidence uh, that this might um, sort of agrees with what we're finding, which is nice. Um, and so we can skip straight through to the mass loss rates and here uh, the, I'm showing you, essentially, we look at the left-hand side of the diagram first, where we kind of know what's going on. And we're seeing here uh, the Vink predictions and the Bjorken predictions in the dotted line, the dashed line, and the empirical findings uh, are these points. And again, we're sort of a general factor lower than the Vink rates, and we're within uh, a better agreement with the Bjorken rates. And on the left-hand side of the diagram are stars that, uh, well, the, we think the winds are much, uh, we call these weak wind stars. We kind of know less about what's going on. So just showing you here, there's still some uncertainties uh, when we're trying to diagnose mass loss rates. We're doing okay in this range. Um, and the average clumping factors that we find, you know, as I showed the trends before, maybe not our, maybe averages aren't the best way to, to, de to determine these, but generally you can kind of see that maybe some of them are being reduced also as we go to metallicities that are lower than the galaxy. Um, and then skip straight through to the SMC. Um, so far, we only have one star that we've been able to fit in the SMC. Uh, just uh, unfortunately, there wasn't optical data essentially for the rest of the UV uh, to, to complement it. So we only have a simultaneous optical UV fit for this star. But again, you can see a good pre good peaks in the fitness distributions. And uh, now we can see you know what might happen to the mass loss rates. And this is the one star that I've been talking about here in red um, compared to another study that's also looking at mass loss rates of massive stars but assuming that the clumps are optically thin. So maybe there are some issues there, but actually we get a fairly good agreement in this case between the mass loss rates. So maybe we can just extrapolate for now and say that, you know, actually, yeah, the, the study that's, um, that's looked at stars in the SMC are finding similar reductions. And so maybe, you know, this is also something that can be used uh, for these predictions of mass loss rates. Okay. So those are sort of the main things I wanted to talk about. And there's one sort of final uh, thing that I did during my PhD that I want to mention, and that's um, we had this opportunity uh, with uh, the Ulysses survey that was released uh, over the past couple of years, which is, um, you know, as, we, as I said before, we need uh, UV and optical uh, profiles to be able to diagnose uh, the winds of massive stars. And thanks to Laurent's study, we're able to do it for about 20, 30 stars with 40 orbits. Um, and so the, the people that run Hubble essentially decided this is a great idea. Let's do it for 500 orbits and look at 250 stars in the LMC and the SMC. And the UV spectra are coming out now. Um, and the community sort of banded together to follow this up in the optical uh, with one of the telescopes in Chile as well. And that will be coming soon. So we thought, what can we do now uh, that we only have the UV to diagnose the winds of massive stars, you know, while I'm still in my PhD? 
and we decided to, you know, well, look at the terminal wind speeds. But so first I'll mention just the fact that, you know, this is the coverage we're now getting for these 250 stars compared to the sample I used in my PhD in orange. Um, and you can see we're, again, expanding the parameter range. And also we have higher resolution coverage of the, all this parameter space and temperature luminosity. Um, and so while we don't have super extensive fits to these stars yet, some of them do exist in the literature, and we can use that along with calibrations to determine you know, rough estimates for temperature and luminosity for these stars. Um, and using those, as you can see plotted on this diagram, we can essentially assign that to the nearest point in, a, in an evolutionary diagram, which is overplotted here, uh, these black lines, and say, well, if the star is around about here, it's closer to this line, maybe it's about that mass. And so then we can figure out what's the escape speed required to get out of the surface of the star. Um, and so this is the first thing we're able to do after we, well, we compare essentially the wind speeds with, um, yeah, what we're finding yeah, using these calibrations. Um, and so to find a terminal wind speed for a star, and this is what I mean by that is the maximum extent of the speed of the wind uh, outflow, we can essentially do this, um, as I said, by looking at these p signy line profiles. Um, and as I said before, uh, essentially you end up with a situation where the blue shifted light coming towards you is being absorbed so strongly that no light is actually reaching you anymore. Um, and so the high blue shift means that the material has to be moving very fast. Uh, and so you essentially have, you know, the, the distance from the line center here in blue shift corresponds to the velocity of the outflow. Um, and you can measure really just directly off, the, off this line profile what the terminal wind speed is. But we decided to also fit this region. You can see that it's highlighted in uh, these dashed lines. Um, and so we, we can do that with simplified models of uh, line profiles from massive stars um, and get an estimate of the terminal wind speeds. And so what comes out? Uh, a strong trend with the escape speed, which is, uh, is sort of intuitive. You know, as you escape from the star, uh, as it becomes harder to escape from the star, you think maybe that actually the, the, the wind speed you reach should also go up as well. Um, and using this, uh, we also have a, a strong uh, correlation with temperature. And so using what we found along with measurements from literature, uh, for example, in the galaxy, you can see, uh, you can sort of quantify these trends with temperature, escape speed, metallicity, um, and hopefully be able to make predictions uh, because we have these sort of very nice trends, right? This is just like a downward shift in terminal wind speed metallicity to, to predict, um, yeah, terminal wind speeds where you don't have the diagnostics if we trust what we're finding here um, and extrapolate that to other stars. And so that's essentially everything I wanted to cover. So I'm showing you a summary here with just some of the most you know important uh, plots. Um, but sort of the, the main takeaways is that throughout the PhD, we were able to find that we're getting accurate mass loss rates for massive stars. And these tend to be a factor of three or so slightly higher or lower than those that are generally being used in predictions of stellar evolution. Um, and we've also, uh, sort of in, in tandem with that, been able to get the first um, constraints empirically of, of parameters associated with optically thick clumps. Um, and finally, to get terminal wind speed, um, temperature and metallicity calibrations, thanks to the Ulysses survey. Um, and so I wanted to qu quickly mention a few things that we think you know, we'll be able to do soon. Um, and that's, you know, as I said, we have these terminal wind relations with metallicity and temperature now that we have so many stars. We were able to do that when the, when the, the optical follow-up to Ulysses comes for mass loss rates and clumping parameters as well. So that'll be really exciting. Um, and also with new instruments that are becoming available uh, in these sort of ground-based observatories, we're also able to go to higher wavelengths. Um, and so things like infrared diagnostics become important because they probe different areas of the wind outflow. And you can sort of uh, then, yeah, as you say, probe different uh, sort of velocity extents um, in the wind and then figure out what's going on with the clumping uh, as a function of, uh, of radius, essentially, as you're moving away from the star. Um, and just quickly mentioning that some work is also being done in the group uh, to try and understand some of these stellar winds that are a little bit lying off the trend that I showed before that were sort of much lower mass loss rates than have been predicted and um, what we're finding because the diagnostics become a little bit harder to, to um, predict, essentially, because of the physics that's going on in these stars. And that's everything. So thanks for listening. And I'm happy to take questions at this point. Thank you, uh, Callum. 
Then, uh, before we go to the questions, let me first take the opportunity to um, introduce to you the members of the examination committee. Um, we have to excuse for several foreseen and unforeseen reasons uh, four members of the uh, examination committee today. They were present during the preliminary defense that we had on 25th of May, and they discussed with Callum his work in uh, full detail. And uh, that is uh, Professor Brankitsa uh, Kubatova of the Astronomical Institute of the Czech Academy of Sciences, uh, Dr. Joachim Puls of the LMU in Munich, Professor Alex de Koter uh, of the Astronomical Institute Anton Pannekoek in Amsterdam, and also the Department of Physics and Astronomy here in KU Leuven, and uh, Professor uh, Leen de Sin also of the Department of Physics and Astronomy in KU Leuven. Then present today uh, online is uh, Dr. Jean-Claude Bourret. Um, let me find on my paper, yes. Uh, professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Jean-Claude Bourret of the Laboratoire d'Astrophysique de Marseille. And then we have uh, present in the room um, the three uh, supervisors and co-supervisors, uh, Professor uh, Hugh Sana of the Department of Physics and Astronomy, KU Leuven, um, Professor uh, John Sundquist, also of the same department, and Dr. Laurent Mahi of the Royal Observatory of Belgium. And my name is Marguerite van Baal, and I am also of the Department of Physics and Astronomy of KU Leuven. Okay, that was a long list. Then we can now, after the short break for Callum, uh, go to the questions, and I would like to first ask uh, Dr. Jean-Claude Bourret online to connect, ah, there we are, and uh, to uh, ask his questions. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I think we can yes. hear you fairly okay. well. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, congratulations, Callum. Uh, yes. Again, again. <laughs> it's a pleasure <laughs> to hear you in the time. So uh, I think this presentation today was, uh, I think even better than the first one. So. Uh, it's really impressive. Uh, I really like it. It's very clear. Uh, the, the introduction, especially, was uh, amazing. I think, and uh, I would like to ask you if, you if I can use your some of, the, of your slides in the future for my students. I think. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I just have uh, a few questions. Uh, I don't think you mentioned it uh, in the presentation today, but it's a uh, part of your manuscript, and I think I saw it in, in somewhere in one of the table. Uh, so you, you remember this uh, parameter called macro turbulence? And yeah. so I would like to know uh, if you can tell me more uh, from the physics standpoint, uh, what is the cause for this uh, macro turbulence? What kind of phenomena are associated to it? Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. So uh, yeah, asking about the macro turbulence. Um, and so are the micro turbulence, I can't remember which one, uh, or both, I guess. Michael. Yeah, so we have uh, essentially what's going on in the outer atmosphere of the star is that you have these turbulent motions that maybe can be linked to other stellar parameters. Um, and these, uh, the turbulence sort of broadens the line profile. So we also have a diagnostic of it, uh, as, as, as Jean-Claude says. And it's something that we've been able to kind of diagnose uh, to some extent, fitting the line profiles of these stars. Um, and so, you know, it's 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 something we can we can find, but I don't know if we have anything that's sort of like concrete trends that would link it to any sort of physical parameters uh, from this work per se. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that will be interesting to see if we can find out on the larger survey. Um, one of the other things we can find for turbulence is like, uh, as I as I mentioned here, you know, you can you can get a sense of the turbulent velocity uh, from the slope of this profile here. Um, and so that gives us also an idea of, of, of what's going on turbulence wise. Um, and so, yeah, again, we, so we have these diagnostics and hopefully, yeah, we'll be able to see if there are any trends um, with physical parameters. But for now, yeah, I, I don't think I can really say, uh, you know, that this would be linked to, you know, something like uh, the clumping in the wind or, or, uh, or the temperature or anything like that. But yeah, so I hope that so answers your question. Uh, how hard do you think would it be to, uh 
to take it uh, into account in the models. Uh, because right now, uh, I think macro turbulence is a parameter, is, a kind, is kind of a ad hoc parameter that we introduce later yeah. after the model is computed to fit mm -hmm. the observations, right? Uh, how, how do you think it would be to uh, include it uh, in the first steps of the model? Do you have an idea? Yeah, it's actually Because I am clueless. In, I, and... No, yeah, yeah, I also would, wouldn't really know. But I, I guess one of the ways you could kind of do this is, as, as I showed in this sort of 2D diagram, you have some idea of turbulence when you start to move into other dimensions, right? So if, if you start to get into simulations in 3D, uh, of, of the stellar wind, then you sort of are able to kind of tell maybe to some degree uh, what turbulent velocities are involved. And then hopefully, you know, if you can eventually start to do uh, synthetic spectra from, from those kinds of simulations, then maybe you can also tell something about the turbulence, you know, just straight away, as opposed to having to, as you say, just sort of include this factor to broaden the profile to whatever's needed. Uh, okay, so yeah. you bring me directly to my next uh, question that I had. Uh, I want you to have your, to have your opinion about um, what should be the next steps in the modeling of massive stars and what kind yeah. of uh, general direction we should take. Uh, yeah. Should we start now to uh, move away from 1D model and go to 3D models, as you mentioned? Yeah, I mean, yeah, if possible, it's, it's a great way to go, right? So it's, as you say, the, the reason we don't do 3D now is because it's so expensive computationally. Um, but it's something that's being worked on, uh, especially in, in, in the group, in Jan's group, is now uh, people are sort of being hired to work exactly on this, doing massive star models in 3D. And there are some other, uh, obviously, some other works that are being done in other institutes. But nobody's really looking at producing synthetic spectra as of yet from these models. Um, and so when we have that, you know, we'll be able to compare to, you know, the wealth of observational data that's being made available. Um, and so that, yeah, I think is sort of an exciting way to go. Because as I say, you know, currently now we're using these average factors even to just measure the uh, the winds um, in in a one D sense, and so you know, you, you sort of when you move to three D, you get a sense of uh, exactly how the, this is going uh, throughout the whole wind. And I think I'm sort of rambling a bit, so I'll stop there and just say, yeah, three three D would be good. Basically, I think it's a good way yeah. to go. <laughs> and so I, I remember you. I remember that uh, when I started, uh, there was uh, this uh, uh, goal uh, in our field that, uh, to build what they called combined models. Uh, so there was, that was models combining stellar structure and atmosphere and winds together on the same footing. Uh, so I, I think uh, people don't work on that that much anymore. Uh, do you know uh, if uh, do you have an idea if this would be an important direction? Uh, what would be the reason why we should uh, do this again? Uh, yeah, it's, it's it definitely would be nice. I mean, I've seen some works, for example, like, um, as you say, to sort of looking at the, the evolutionary diagrams, uh, essentially using uh, stellar structure models, right, to, to predict uh, how the star is evolving over time and taking each of those points and then assigning that to the, the parameters to a stellar uh, model that you can get spectra out of and essentially linking them that way. So you've got the, the, the those two ways to do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, this would be sort of, as you say, really, really nice to be able to do something like that to, to you know, as I say, for now, we're, we're essentially relying on just taking like a temperature and a luminosity point and assigning that to, uh, a HR diagram point, and hopefully, you know, that's close enough. But if you have, you know, the, the, the capability to really explore the full uh, evolutionary diagram with with the models that are sort of getting you the, the emergent spectrum out that you can actually use for the observations, then, yeah, it'd be a really good way to sort of actually nail down what's going on at any stage uh, and reduce all the uncertainties in stellar evolution. I think also, I mean, uh, I know there are some new versions of, like, the FastWind code that have been used to... Um, yeah, essentially from any flux point or from any HR diagram point, also predict the the emergent uh, mass loss rate and uh, that yeah sort of gives you the coupling there. I think to to get synthetic spectra out of uh, yeah what, one of these diagrams. And, yeah. Can I ask two more questions or am I done? Yes, of course. Okay, so uh, 
in, in the presentation today, you mentioned several times uh, that the solutions you find are statistically significant. Yeah. Uh, so I was just uh, wondering if you could tell us a bit more about what kind of criteria you used for, to decide what was significant or not significant. And if, yeah. if you can tell us a bit more about the, uh, the kind of analysis you did. Yeah, so I mean, for for example, for the, these sort of solutions, um, you know, the, mm -hmm. in statistical significance, we sort of, um, we, uh, well, we the, these solutions, I guess, are the ones that are less statistically significant, right? So we have, essentially, we normalize to the best fit in this case. So we, we hope that the best fit is representative of what's going on in the model, but there are obviously things we're leaving out, like, uh, you know, there might be various sort of effects, like, um, you know, the, the sort of like blending with the lines or physics we're not aware of. And so in that case, you know, we might not be reproducing the star to sort of the, the real um, statistical accuracy needed to say that it's significant. But when we talk about statistical significance in, in the solution that we find here, we mean sort of relative to the rest of the, the, the models that are the best we can do. Um, so we, we say that, you know, we actually are finding um, a, a solution that can be distinguished from essentially any random model from any random combination of parameters. So we hope that this is close enough to the stellar parameters that we're finding. Um, so that's that statistical significance. And then when we talk about, for example, these trends, um, yeah, that's looking at whether, again, a sort of random sampling of any sort of combination of clumping parameter with temperature would also predict uh, a statistical correlation or whether this is actually a unique uh, statistically significant trend, uh, just as assuming a monotonic relationship um, from the, you know, there's some statistical criteria, I can't remember exactly the names right now, uh, but if we're interested, we can discuss that in more detail. Yeah. Okay. Some of the time. And so maybe my last question, uh, I was just curious, uh, what did you find the most difficult, the most interesting, the most boring <laughs> in the work you did over the last four years? <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah, <'cause>, uh, <laughs> I suppose, you know, where, 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 where one of the, the thing I probably found the most difficult was actually just getting all this stuff to work, right? So we had to, for, for the first sort of six months of the PhD, we were trying to get the genetic algorithm to work um, and mm -hmm. we couldn't do it. So we decided to write it again from scratch. Uh, essentially, well, not from scratch. We, we have the other one to base it on, but we built it in a new language instead. And then we were able to get it working and, and come out in the end. So that was definitely difficult. Um, and uh, yeah, I suppose I, 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 I won't go into, you know, other things like the worst parts and the most boring parts. But uh, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it's, it's been once everything started working, you know, we've had these great opportunities with uh, the, the observations that we've been able to get that are sort of really like groundbreaking compared to the samples that have been available in the past. So it's been really like a privilege to work in such an exciting uh, time in this field, especially with like the Ulysses that just came out and we decided, yeah, let's jump on that, which might not necessarily have been the case if it had been delayed like a year uh, or anything, for example. So that's been a lot of fun being able to just kind of like, yeah, work to what's going on in the field uh, instead of being stuck to like a strict, I suppose, outline for the PhD maybe. Okay, thank you. Great achievement again. Congratulations. Cheers, thanks JC. Thank you. Then I uh, give the word to Dr. Mahi. Um, hi, Kalum. Um, let me first congr congratulate you for this work. Uh, I remember when we interviewed you four years ago that we said all together that we thought that we you had uh, a very steep learning curve and I think now you demonstrate that it actually we were right so thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> um, I will start uh, I'm, maybe if, if you just uh, can can show us the, the slide 2027 where yeah. all the parameters that you you have fitted are, are mentioned yeah um, maybe one you have never included in your models is the micro turbulence mm -hmm. Uh, so we know that good indicators for this micro turbulence is or are the iron line in the UV. Yep. But of course, with the, the, the current, gener uh, current version of fast wind, it's not possible to fit those lines. So maybe one question could be how that parameter impact your results. 
Can you say a few words about that? Yeah, that's a, also a very good point. So I think in terms of our results, that parameter is not having such a big impact. Again, mainly because, as I say, we're looking at these really strong line profiles, right? If you want to get into looking at things like, as you said, uh, the iron lines or these sort of, you know, other transitions of metals that aren't so significant or aren't so strong moving away from the continuum, yeah, you really need to take into account things like micro turbulence, the, these additional velocities that are affecting the strength of the lines. Um, and as you say, you know, it's not been available in the current version of Fastwind, and we sort of assume uh, one value that we sort of think works okay um, at, the, at the base of the photosphere and in the stellar structure. But yeah, in the new version, as you say, we're, we're able to sort of produce this full spectrum um, and with models that, you know, take a little bit longer than the ones we're currently running, but not a crazy amount of time longer, mm -hmm. right? So it's still a, on the order of you can run a lot of models, maybe not, you know, the 40,000 we're running per star now, mm -hmm. but I think it's yeah, something we'll be able to include, um, especially as you say, we have high resolution UV spectra also to come or that are now available that, yeah, give us all mm -hmm. these diagnostics. Do, do, do you think that parameters as impact on, on the mass loss, for instance? Or... Um, yeah, I, as far as I could say now, I would say it doesn't have that big of an impact as something, you know, like the other uncertainties that we're including here, like the the, the wind structure, mm -hmm. as, as you say, can it have like a real uh, increase the uncertainty by like a factor of three or something. So I think, yeah, maybe the focus on, on these kinds of things is probably fine in terms of microturbulence. Maybe the uncertainty is something that, you know, it's not... Uh, yeah, I don't think we're at the point of accuracy where we could really say that, you know, any one microturbulence mm -hmm. solution is actually significantly changing the mass loss rate we get out in the end. Um, so maybe we're okay for now. But Okay, okay. thanks. thanks. Uh, one, one more question, maybe. Um, you mentioned in your presentation the GWST. So we were, we'll be able in the future to go to lower and lower uh, metallicity environments. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe one thing we should start first to understand is the weak wind problem because stars will show less and less uh, yeah. wind. Um, in which direction can we go to understand those beasts? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's definitely a, a thing to focus on. So there's sort of like, as you say, almost two weak wind problems, right? So you have the situation where uh, as you go to lower metallicity, the winds become weaker in general. Um, and you also have uh, below a certain luminosity, the wind diagnostics essentially disappear. And so you think you have weak winds. Um, and so, as you say, I guess to, to, to sort of go to lower metallicity than we currently have is hard, right? So there's maybe we can look at uh, another region like Sexton Say, which is the 10th of solar. And there we might be able to still fit stars, UV and optical combined to be able to diagnose and make further predictions of what's happening as the winds are getting weaker with metallicity. Uh, as for the weak winds at low luminosity, we kind of need to work on our assumptions and our models a bit, right? So there's one of the um, the theories that's coming out um, now is that, you know, we're, we think these winds are weak because there's no diagnostics, but might, that might not be because the winds are weak. It might be because as you go to lower, lower luminosities, the physics in the atmosphere of the star is changing. So the winds are um, essentially... Uh, less dense so they don't have the opportunity to cool through all the metal ions and so everything remains ionized and you lose the diagnostics but that doesn't necessarily mean that the wind isn't there it just means that it's hot and you can't see it um so yeah we need to look at other things like um you know higher wavelength diagnostics that maybe probe uh, this more accurately or the x-rays where we think that the, the flux should be if the wind is super hot um, and that maybe will be able to tell us uh, what the mass loss rates are if we if we trust that sort of interpretation from the models so yeah, I think yeah, okay. two different ways to to approach the problems. And maybe one last question: uh, since you will move away uh, in 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 the US, yeah. I work on population synthesis. How this work here can help you in the future yeah. for your next position? Yeah, I mean, as I say, I've uh, through the the steep learning curve, I've, I've <laughs> learned quite a lot that'll help me there. But in general, like as you say, as you look at um, further away galaxies, you can't resolve stars anymore, uh, but you can see strong features in composite spectra of galaxies. So one of the strong features is, for example, these uh, the wind lines that we've been focusing on, um, like these carbon-4 lines and other lines that are being formed by massive stars, um, maybe not necessarily the exact massive stars that we've looked at here, but to some extent, for sure. 
Um, and so, yeah, in, interpreting, you know, the strength of these profiles in other galaxies, we're going to have to be taking into account the, the things we've learned about the winds here, um, as well as, you know, trying to interpret, you know, what stars are there to form the, the profiles in general. So hopefully that will help, but we'll see. Yeah, another learning curve to come, I think. <laughs> Thanks. 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 All right. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I figured it was. <laughs> My apologies. Uh... All right. Uh, okay, Callum, congratulations um, again. Yeah. Um, it was a pleasure. It was a really nice talk today, I must say. Uh, very nice to to hear this uh, explained in this. And um, well, from my side first, uh, I also want to say that it's uh, your work in particular have been a real pleasure. And I think this slide actually summarizes it uh, very well because it was actually something, well, I myself, since I started in the field or since I more or less graduated, I basically promised to do this in every project mm -hmm. and I haven't <laughs> managed to do it. So uh, I never, uh, I always actually said that, okay, but in this project, we're going to get these type of nice statistical uh, fits, you know, we're going to do this in a global, but I never figure out how to do it, actually. So it's, it's really nice to, to see that, that you and, and, and Ub Loran, in this case, uh, really were able to finally get, finally get this done. Very impressive, I must say. So uh, very nice, and congrats. Um, now, I do have now, when I see this, actually, uh, two questions also here. Uh, first, it's always been, you talked about this, that it's imperfection in the models, right? You're trying to do a 1D uh, uh, fit, you're using a 1D model to try to fit essentially 3D phenomena, as you explained. But when you look at your, your fit, particularly for the massless rates, it's not just for this star, right? They're actually statistically significant, and they're they're nicely peaked. So. Now I want a good explanation because I'm thinking about this. My, why do you think that it is that the mass loss rate is so well constrained uh, by this type of global fitting? Because all we hear in the community for the last ten years is like, yeah, yeah, but you can, you know, fit around the mass loss rate here and there in the empirical fittings. But that's not really the case here, it seems. So, yeah, yeah, I think you know, really the 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 power we have is the, all the diagnostics that are available to us, right? So we have you know, optical and UV and a large range of wind diagnostics at high resolution. So, I mean, we don't just have a couple of p signy profiles. We have like really a lot uh, that are covering uh, and a lot of recombination lines as well. And so as you start to play with all the different parameters and different combinations, you, you, yeah, as, as, as the GA comes out and finds, you, you really can't uh, include to like no. deviate too much in different combinations and get as good a fit and get as good a solution. So I think, yeah, I mean, we really, for this one in particular, we're able to really constrain it well with the diagnostics we have. And uh, it's because that's what we focused on, right? So, you know, if we weren't so interested in mass loss and we were more interested in temperature or something, maybe we wouldn't have included all these wind diagnostics and we'd have looked at something else, like uh, as Laurent mentioned, like these iron lines in the UV or some other small uh, metal lines are more sensitive to temperature. And maybe we could have got more like well-defined peaks there instead. But yeah, I think, yeah, this, this has sort of been the diagnostic power that's got on us to be able to to include these mass traits. And as you say, we think this is a really good statistically significant fit. But maybe if you go into 3D and you find that actually the winds are, you know, less dense than we think they are, and we have to correct this by some factor, you know, mm -hmm. maybe, uh, yeah, the mass loss rates can change again. But hopefully not like uh, by a factor of three like we've been finding yeah. in the past. Now it's so. starting to look uh, really good, I must say. Um, from from this type of it. Um, so actually, then I I had a little bit of follow up, and that's also, of course, since you, since you've had the uh, <laughs> this fortune to to having to go between, you know, basically my group and then Ug's group and then <laughs> my group again. I understand it's been confusing, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but always when you come back to me, it's like, yeah, but you know, all stars they live in binaries, huh? But I I didn't hear any binaries here in the talk, so. Yeah. Where are they? Can you really do this? this? Is a single model atmosphere? What makes you say that you can do mo single model stellar model atmosphere for massive stars? Because well, they're basically all binaries, huh? Yeah, so it's definitely something that's an issue, right? And you know, Oog will be the first person to tell you we have to think about binaries. And I'm probably the only person in the group now that's left that's 
you know, saying, ah, we're not worried about the binary. Um, so I, as you say, you know, the, one of the things we do is to try and get the stars where there aren't radial velocity variations that are so significant that, you know, we think they would affect uh, the profiles. Um, and, you know, hopefully that means that if it is a binary, the binary is um, separated to such a degree that the wind from this star isn't necessarily interacting with that star, at least at this time that we're observing it. And so hopefully we can tell uh, the massless rate that's actually going on. But yeah, there's an uncertainty there in like, you know, what if the stars interacted in the past and then where it's a different place in the HR diagram than we think it should be and the massless rate is a, being assigned to the wrong point. Um, so that's a problem. And there's also, you know, if you see some stars that don't necessarily look like they're binaries to begin with, um, and then you end up with, uh, I mean, where's this plot? We think, uh, for example, these two stars uh, that are really falling off the trend actually have significant radial velocity variations. And so we've not been able to, you know, find a solution to say that it's definitely a binary, but, you know, it seems like that could definitely be a factor there. And that's, yeah, could be one of the reasons that these are completely different from the normal the single stars we're studying. So yeah, definitely uh, something to consider. And if you were able to model binary wins, like I think, you know, has kind of been done in an approximate way in the past, and maybe will start to be done in the future when you just put two stars in the same model and see what comes out. And, uh, yeah, that would yeah. be the way to go. Yeah. Thank you. And then uh, one final. Actually, I wanted to ask uh, more or less to say <laughs> similar as, as Laurent about the future, because now you're off and you're going scaling up, let's just say it like that, mm -hmm. uh, toward full galaxy population. So I will go into the next level of detail. And now, if you think about this, uh, when you're going to do population synthesis, you're going to have to run a, a, you know, a whole lot of models, right, um, to create stellar spectral libraries. And you mentioned this. One of the advantages with your approach here is that one model is, is really fast. Right? Um, do you think that these type of models that you have here, is that something that you could include also in, in like pop synthesis models. Um, and uh, do you think that, for example, this that you have focused on a lot here, um, you know, effects from optogolithic clumping, could that be important also when you model um, like starburst galaxies or something like that? Yeah, so uh, as you say, it's definitely something that I've been thinking about just because it's something that I work on. And as you say, it's affecting uh, the strength of uh, these P-Signy lines, right, the, the amount of light that's getting out of the wind to actually observe the, what we're actually observing. And so if you look at a composite spectrum, say, and you have, you know, a ton of different stars combining together to make one P-Signy profile for a whole population, but you think on average, all the massive stars are contributing way less uh, to that line individually, then maybe you have to rethink the whole population in general. You know, you should have, maybe you need more massive stars to reproduce the same thing that you would have initially. Um, and so... Yeah, maybe that's one way to go. And you know, it's also something that, yeah, if we're sensitive to these effects at the at the scales that we're looking at and at the sensitivities we have, or whether we're looking at, you know, these really super strong lines that are coming from the more extreme massive stars, like Wolf Rayet stars with super strong emission features. Um, and in that case, you know, it's not something that we've been working on here, but it's something that now can be modeled with, you know, the new versions of the codes we're using. So you know, there's definitely a way to go there. Uh, to start to include stuff like yeah, that. It would be very interesting actually to see this because I remember uh, Klaus later uh, actually mentioned this in like a proceedings 10 years ago, but I haven't seen anything so when you're going then. Mm -hmm. uh, keep it in the back of your head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, congratulations again, Callum. Um, that was this for me. I well... <laughs> I think I've already asked you a lot of questions over the last uh, four years, uh, but I still have some in store. And it's mostly questions about getting your opinion about stuff, not because I, I know that you know your topic very well and you've been thinking deeply about uh, some of the tasks that you've been doing. Sure. Um, for example, the fitting method that uh, we've been using, this genetic algorithm, we are now thinking about deploying it on a sample which is 10 times uh larger i mean we are we are actually doing it uh, so some of the people in amsterdam uh, sarah for example mm -hmm. and frank are uh, deploying it is there anything that uh, we need to be careful about uh, points of attention yeah i mean i'm sure there are lots um but off the <laughs> you know as you say off the top of my head like uh yeah i suppose we need to be careful of 
as you say, what you're fitting, I guess, and what your interpretation is. So like, yeah, yeah if you, for example, sort of try and apply these models all over the, the full sample, like you say, when you get to maybe weak wind stars and you see less of these diagnostics, mm -hmm. you know, um, you could just slap a GA best fit on it and say, this is great. This is what we think the star looks like. It might not necessarily be true. So I think we have to be careful of, yeah, the diagnostics we have um, and also yeah, just sort of interpreting, you know, how well our models are representing what's going on, um, essentially. And yeah, I would say just being aware of the, the, where our capabilities end with what we currently have and where it's maybe better to start using something else, like, uh, you know, to, to, to try and isolate some of these stars and develop more intense modeling techniques to, to try and find, yeah, solutions that are maybe more physically relevant than, uh, than just applying uh, what we have to just about anything um but yeah i suppose the other thing is that you know as we say we're moving into higher wavelengths now with with the other diagnostics that we have and then maybe something like the stratification of the wind becomes more important than what's been included now and so you know we so in the current models we just say the wind increases linearly to maximum and then that's the structure continues as is but if that's not the case then that's also going to be affecting you know these line strengths at various wavelengths regimes um yeah so i think just to be aware of uh, yeah what where 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 the models are relevant and where we need to work on uh, yeah the the physics that we're putting in i think is the main thing when we move to large samples because i mean it's still a, on a time scale that we can actually use this to model 200 something stars mm -hmm. right but you know maybe in the future when we have like a thousand stars it's not feasible and we have to do something else again like some machine learning technique or something um so yeah hopefully we shall see. Yep. Uh, maybe one uh, a final question about the physics. One of the surprising results from uh, your thesis, uh, to me, uh, is the fact that you have such a tight correlation between the terminal wind speed of the DLC sample and effective temperature. Mm. While, I mean, in the community, we've been a lot thinking about the correlation uh, with respect to the escape speed. Uh, I know that you've been thinking a little more about the, uh, the cause of that uh, correlation. Maybe you can say a few words about that. Yeah. So I think, uh, as you say, the sort of the the sort of intuitive trend is with escape speed, right? Because you think, you know, as if the escape speed is higher, then the wind speed has to be higher, and so these things should scale as the star becomes more massive. Um, and it's not necessarily so clear that that should happen essentially with temperature directly. Um, but there's sort of been some uh, yeah, some efforts from like uh, the collaborators that we've invited into this work to think about where could this theoretical, you know, really tight trend be coming from. Um, and if you sort of propagate, you know, a mass luminosity relationship, assuming, um, yeah, one sort of, I guess, what would you say, like the shape of that relationship, um, you can essentially get out this linear relationship between V infinity and, and, and temperature. Um, but it's just whether we trust you know, the exponent we're using to create the shape of that profile for these stars. Um, and so maybe we, we, if we can look more, uh, as you say, more in depth into that, maybe we can actually say, yeah, this is, this is theoretical footing for what we're finding. I think for now it's a little bit hard to say, but I don't see why we won't be able to work on that more in the future and uh, yeah, have a theoretical explanation as well. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And this is a public defense, so I guess there may be also some questions or remarks from uh, the audience. Yeah, I shall bring the microphone. Who is it? Is it Dom? Thanks, Callum. This is uh, fantastic work. Um, I want to push you outside to, of your wind comfort zone a little bit. You have a HR diagram at some point with the Ulysses sample. Yeah. Can you perhaps um, reshow that? Somewhere over here. Yeah. Yeah, that'll do. So are these, are these evolution tracks calculated with, with which wind prescription? Yeah, so these are coming from the, um, from the, the models from Brot et al. in 2011. So this is using, uh, as we mentioned, the, the more commonly implemented stellar evolution mass loss wind prescription, which are the ones that come from Vink, which we showed before. Uh, and, you know, as you rightly point out, these maybe aren't necessarily the wind prescriptions that we think match the, 
the observations as well. Um, and you know, we have the the diagram I showed in the beginning showing the shift between the two uh, evolutionary tracks just by changing this by a factor of three. I mean, certainly in these regions at the beginning, right, you have some shift uh, that's going to be systematic throughout the whole sample, essentially, if you change the wind prescription. And uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely something to consider. And that's something that's also being worked on in like the larger Ulysses collaboration, I think, is to make new stellar evolution models. Um, you know, similar parameter space coverage, but with updated uh, wind, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so one of the working groups, I think, is working on that. And then we'll be able to, you know, maybe actually uh, correct this to some degree for, yeah, for the new understanding we have of the winds. Okay, that's good. Here's my question. Um, so, so this is with the, the Brock tracks. Um, so you've got stars to the right of the diagram on both the LMC and the SMC samples. Yeah. Uh, and if you, if you have a lower mass loss rate, that means your tracks are going to be more to the left, right? Um, so how, how can we get stars over there? What, what physics do we need to do? Is that coming from wind physics or is that coming from something else? These stars over here. Um, yeah. It's a good question, actually. How do we end up with stars that are uh, much lower temperature than we would predict um, from, yeah, as you say, these evolutionary tracks? Um, I don't know. Maybe you end up with these are sort of really evolved counterparts of some kinds of stars. And so you have to consider, yeah, maybe taking these tracks beyond, you know, where we've cut them off here, which I think is somewhere like maybe the end of hydrogen burning or if somebody knows better. Um, or maybe there's, as you say, some kind of uh, yeah, effects from, you know, uh, maybe a binary is causing something like this. Uh, I can sort of throw that in there without really knowing what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, I, I, do. I, I suppose I, I think it would be hard to end up with these stars from, you know, the uncertainties in, in for example, in the winds that we're looking at here. So I guess there's really something else we need to consider. Uh, and as you say, one of these things is maybe. So I think what would be really interesting is because at the moment we just have a sample, right? You, you have a sample. Yeah. But to try and separate the differences between stars on the main sequence and the post-main sequence would be very yeah, interesting. Exactly. And to try and understand whether these, uh, whether this is a, a sample of two halves or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd be very interested uh, once we know what the evolutionary state of your sample is, uh, if the wind parameters are different or not. Yep. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Do we have other questions in the room? Or remarks? No. And we have a, uh, a true hybrid session. I see we also have a YouTube audience. Do we have questions from the YouTube audience? I see there are none. So in that case, uh, we can um, finish the discussion and the committee will then leave the room for a few moments for the deliberation and we will come back for the proclamation. Thank Thanks. you. All right.
Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear Callum, I will now proclaim the results of the deliberation by the examination committee appointed for the doctoral degree in science, astronomy and astrophysics. Mr. Callum Hawcroft has presented to the faculty his PhD thesis on the topic stellar wind properties of O-type stars, mass loss, speeds, structure and quantitative empirical analysis in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the PhD in science, astronomy and astrophysics. And he has defended his thesis in a public session before the examination committee. The examination committee has determined that all the requirements concerning the granting of the doctoral degree that are prescribed by the law and by the university regulations have been met. Therefore, on behalf of the rector of KU Leuven, I confer upon Mr. Callum Hawcroft the degree of Doctor in Science, Astronomy and Astrophysics. Congratulations. I, uh, I close this session, so please uh, be seated. Congratulations, Callum. Congratulations to all who have directly or indirectly uh, contributed to uh, this PhD, also to the promoters. And um, I will give you now your provisional diploma. I don't know if you have a pen, because I did not bring a pen, because you have to sign for... <laughs> If you can sign here for the receipt, and then yeah. this is your diploma. And then I think uh, the promoters, or uh, Hugh, in on behalf of the promoters, would like to say something. Very long, four years or so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just have a seat. To you. It will not be too long. It should not be too long because it's very late. And you are really at the last minute of the last day of the last week of the last moment of the academic session. Uh, because we are closing today the academic uh, year to go for a break and then we only come back in five or six weeks so it was very good to be able to uh, terminate on a high note i think uh, this uh, this uh, this semester so dear Callum, dear dr Alcroft, uh i always like to be the first to call the new doctor by its uh, new title um, so here we are at the end of uh, an adventure of four years and I have to say it has been a pleasure for me to work with you, to have you around and uh, to discuss a, a lot uh, with you. So you might not have experienced it like it, like this, but to me it has always been a very smooth uh, process. So for example, for the first year you've been uh, playing around for a full year with fast wind, playing with the parameters one at a time and with the GA without getting any results, and I think that was very smooth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you mentioned already, right, uh, that uh, you started with the Fortran version of, uh, of the code, and when I mentioned, look, maybe you need to learn Fortran, you look at me, Fortran, what is this? This language from the 60s. Uh, but uh, it, was very, it was working with seven and nine dimensions, but we had to port it to 15 dimensions. And at some point you took the initiative with uh, Michael abdul -Masi. I don't know if Michael is uh, listening today, but he also got credit for that. You decided that Fortran was completely outdated. You don't want to deal with it. And let's do that with a modern uh, uh, language, a modern way of scripting things uh, in Python. And I think that was a great decision. Uh, and uh, not only for you, but that's also help uh, other students in Amsterdam, for example, Sarah and Frank, that are now using uh, uh, their own version of the code, but uh, it uh, they started with, with yours, so that was a very good uh, uh, initiative. So as, you, as I said, right, that was very smooth. 
especially for me. <laughs> um, something that was not so smooth, of course, the COVID uh, happens, and uh, like uh, a lot of uh, well, like everyone else, you uh, had to deal with it, and uh, I'm sure it was not uh, always. Uh, uh, easy. It's been it's been a challenge. I know also for people that had family uh, abroad uh, to be uh, stuck in different countries in those times uh, certainly was uh, not easy. But uh, I think thanks to the friends that you made here in uh, Leuven, in the institute and uh, uh, outside the institute, uh, you managed to form a group of tightly bound persons that were supporting each other, and I think that has been a, a great help. And uh, it's also a uh, testimony of the personality uh, that you have uh, a very easy going, able to connect uh, with uh, people. And uh, you were uh, receiving support, but you were also offering support. And uh, uh, for that, uh, uh, thank you. Um, I mean, I'm always trying to look back a little about who uh, the candidate or the uh, student was uh, before he arrived, what was his personality and what has changed maybe in uh, uh, four years and for you if i if i just try to look back and i have the impression that for the first few months of your thesis maybe you were wondering for yourself how is it that they picked me uh, why uh, have they hired me what what was special about about me that they choose me compared to choosing somebody else and i have to say i've been, I've been trying to look and actually I don't know because I couldn't find my notes back. <laughs> but uh, I actually look for my notes for the interview because you, I, I keep them, uh, but I couldn't find them. But, but what I want to, to mention, one of your strengths that we already spotted in the interview and that was clear from the very beginning, from the first presentation you made, and I think from today too, you have uh, a wonderful ability, ability to uh, distinguish what's essential to what's not so important and to uh, take bits in a complicated landscape, in a complicated environment, and to bring them together to make connections and great summaries about physical problems. And I think that this is a, a, certainly a strength, and I'm so, so certain that this strength uh, was very clear in the, uh, well, in the answer that you gave, but also I am pretty sure that was one of the, uh, the things that helped you to get your next position uh, in, in Baltimore. Uh, it's uh, your ability to summarize uh, uh, a complicated problem uh, well. The other uh, strong point that you have, of course, is your easygoing personality, and that has helped you to navigate the complex maestro collaboration, the different uh, 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 groups, as you mentioned, right? Having three co-supervisors can be a blessing, but it can also be a nightmare, and you need to decide when it's a blessing and when it's a nightmare, and that's really up to the students to do that, and so you did that uh, well. So you know of for a new adventure, a new parameter space, uh, hopefully much broader than the 15 dimension you have been uh, working on in the last uh, few years. Uh, it's a place that is dear to my heart. I had a very good time uh, when I was myself at uh, Space Telescope. Of course, you'll go there as a scientist. I was there as an instrument scientist, so you will have time to do science. I was actually calibrating some of the uh, spectra that uh, uh, you uh, showed today. Uh, certainly, the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore is one of the best places for space-based observations. It's a hot place today uh, for the Hubble. It's well known for Hubble, but James Webb is uh, also around the corner, and I'm sure that you will learn a lot on this new facility uh, too. So there you will find uh, new colleagues, new friends, new mentors. Don't forget you all once, I think from Leuven, I hope, and I'm sure that you've made bonds with a lot of people in the audience for life well beyond uh, astrophysics. All right, so uh, a new parameter space, it's like a new PhD. Uh, you start with a plan and then everything break and then you adapt. And uh, the adaptation, I'll leave that up to you, but to make new plans uh, in your new space, environment uh, in the next few months. I've got you some books about Baltimore and about Maryland. So you can have a look at a lot of the fun things that you can do outside the uh, outside work. Right. Thanks for your work. Congratulations for your work. Uh, it's well deserved and uh, we'll be looking forward to continue working with you in the future and also see what you want to do in your own uh, free time in science.
Does anyone else want to say a few words? You said already during the... Yeah. Good. Do you want to say a few words or shall we just go and drink? Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, I've probably talked more in the past hour than I think I've talked in the past week. So I'm fairly happy to leave the speeches there from Ugg's nice words and just say, yeah, the reception is outside. So maybe after a glass or two of cava, I'll have some more words. But for now, <laughs> so thanks everyone for coming. And yeah, let's go. Uh, enjoy the evening.